finally here and joining me now, he is one of my favorites in the industry, draft analyst now at ESPN. It is the great Jordan Reed. Jordan, thanks for coming on. I think the last time I had a show with you, I was not at PFF, you were not at ESPN, so a lot has changed here. So yeah, first and foremost, just thanks for having me on. And we were talking about you finally putting your face as your profile picture on your Twitter account. So I'm just glad that you're getting your well due uh, what you deserve. And I'm just happy to see your career take off. No, same for you. It's, it, you are one of my favorite followers. You do a tremendous job. Love seeing you now at ESPN. It's been great to see. And you give me a lot of great advice the first time I had you on before I got this gig here. So um, I really appreciate that. And now here we are um, a couple of days away before the 2022 NFL draft. And Jordan, you've been doing this for, for a while now. Is this the most unpredictable draft you've ever worked on? Yeah, without question. I think it's the most predictable since that 2018 draft where we saw five quarterbacks go in the first round. But this one is much different just because with the quarterbacks at the top, we don't necessarily have those quarterbacks at the top like we had in 2018. And it's different than the past three years. In 2019, we knew Kyler Murray was going to be number one. The same with 2020 and with Joe Burrow. And then last year with Trevor Lawrence, everybody knew that the Jaguars were eventually going to take him. So this draft is really mysterious. And it's not just us. It's everybody around the league, too. Nobody knows what's going to happen right now. The latest theme is Trayvon Walker going number one overall. Aiden Hutchinson possibly could be the number one overall pick, too. So it's a lot of mysterious things happening right now. But that's what's going to make this group and this class so much fun. Yeah, definitely. I think the NFL loves that aspect of it as well. All the mystery. Everyone has to tune in, not knowing what's going to happen. It makes it a lot of fun, makes it an, like a, basically a reality TV show um, there for the NFL once Thursday night comes along. Now, um, we'll get to the Jaguars in a second. I want to start off with the quarterback specifically because, you know, I feel like when the draft process started, everyone was like, oh, the quarterbacks are not so great. They won't go as high. Then there was a point where it felt like two or three are going to go high. And now it feels like it's cooling off again. So I guess where are we when it comes to the quarterbacks as we're a few days away from the draft? Yeah, it's just really fun to see the waves as far as how the trends happen with the NFL draft. And it always happens with quarterbacks. You see these guys, whether they're too high or too low and what happens is what I like to call is what I like to call a quarterback tax. So with the quarterback tax, some teams are going to be high on these guys. Some teams are going to be low on them. But as we get closer to the draft, you start to see them get pushed up the board a little bit. You see Desmond Ritter being pegged number 20 to the Steelers. You see Malik Willis getting pushed inside the top 10, maybe to Carolina, maybe to Atlanta, maybe to some other teams that are picking inside of the top 10 too. So I think it's just that quarterback tax of where even though this class may be, quote unquote, a little bit underwhelming than what we have seen in years past. Those guys are always going to be pushed up the board just because it's the most intriguing and the most important position in sports. And nothing matters until you get that spot right. Right. You know, everyone keeps on talking about Malik and Kenny being the top two quarterbacks, whatever order it is. Um, I want to ask you about Matt Corral specifically, because, you know, he got hurt in the bowl game. He wasn't at the senior bowl. People aren't really talking much about him. Is he a potential sneaky first round quarterback in this draft come Thursday night? Yeah, I think so. And you always have to pay attention to those guys that were invited to the opening round of the NFL draft. And he was one of those guys, <clears throat> excuse me, that was invited to the opening round of the NFL draft. So I think the NFL sees him as a number one overall pick or excuse me, first round overall pick. So I think with Corral is really interesting just because his career trajectory has really been an interesting one to watch. Last year, I thought he took much better care of the football, only five interceptions total. And then prior to that, in 2020, he actually had two games of where he had 11 interceptions total. He threw six against Arkansas and then five against LSU. But as he got more comfortable in that Lane Kiffin style of offense, that is really QB friendly, a lot of run pass option, RPO game. He really settled down. And one word I would use to describe his skill set is just quick. He has very quick feet, quick eyes. He has a fantastic release, too. It's lightning quick. So I think he has a lot of fans throughout the league, and I'm really going to be interested to see where he ends up going. Well, definitely. There's a lot of buzz about the first round, back of the first round, where quarterbacks could end up going. Teams trade back into it to get them in order to have the fifth-year option with these quarterbacks. That could be a scenario definitely for Corral. Now, I mentioned how everyone's talking about Pickett, Willis being those top two quarterbacks in the draft. Where do you sit right now when it comes to the Panthers and number six, where basically everyone is having a hard time trying to figure out what they're going to do? Where are you right now with them? I think they're by far the most interesting team in the first round, just because you trade all of these picks for Sam Darnold. You only have one pick 
inside of the top 100, but you have to get this quarterback spot solidified. You cannot trot Sam Darnold, Cam Newton, or PJ Walker out there another year as the starter at any point next year. And the pressure is on Matt rule to win next year. They had the three and no start, but it just went downhill after that, but nothing matters once again, until you get that quarterback spot solidified, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens at number six overall. And I'm not necessarily saying that they have to take a quarterback. They may take an offensive tackle, especially if one of the big three is there for them, Charles cross, Evan Neal, or Kim Aquanu, which is a possibility depending on what happens or how this first round of the top five unravels. They may be sitting at the number six overall pick. They take an offensive tackle, or they may look to trade back. Scott Fitterer traded back four times in his first draft as the GM of the Carolina Panthers learning under John Snyder, we know that he is going to want to move around. He's never satisfied with his, his, his original draft slot. So I think he's one of those GMs of where he wants to move around a little bit to try to recoup some of those picks that he lost in the Sam Darnold trade. So I think his quarterback or offensive tackle or a potential trade back. Do you also get the sense that trading back this year, especially up high in the first round, is far more difficult just because those middle rounds are pretty deep and the top of the first round is not considered as deep as usual? Yeah, without question. And the tough part is there's nobody really to trade up for this year unless there's an offensive tackle that you like at the top, one of those big three, or nobody's going to come up for one of these quarterbacks. I just don't really see that happening this year. This is very different than what we have seen in years past. You know, and with Carolina, what's interesting, again, you mentioned the fact that their first pick is at six and their next pick is at 137. I feel like Baker Mayfield, Jimmy Garoppolo also tie into all of this, and that's where the idea of taking an offensive tackle first and then training for the veteran quarterback Will, if anything, help Matt Rule win right away, which is what which is what he really needs right now in his scenario in Carolina. Now, last week I had Trevor Sikkim on here, and I brought up to him that the Falcons at eight, I don't feel like the quarterback buzz is there enough, which is weird to me because I look at them and Marcus Mariota is the only option. He has a team-friendly deal. This is a team that went all out for Deshaun Watson and failed, traded Matt Ryan for a third round pick. Do you feel like Atlanta at number eight could be a serious quarterback team or, or no? I don't think so, honestly, just because I think with the state of the roster right now, you're really going to waste the entirety of that rookie deal, that cheap rookie deal, trying to build up the roster and build it around the quarterback, as opposed to building it up and potentially dropping the quarterback into it. Marcus Mariota signed essentially a one plus one deal. So he has the guaranteed year this year and he has the option for next year. So I think that gives them a bit of a cushion to find their guy next year. And there's a lot of people excited about the 2023 quarterback class headlined by Ohio, Ohio State's CJ Stroud. And then also Alabama's Bryce Young with the way the Falcons roster is looking right now. They're probably going to be one of those teams picking inside of the top five, but that's just a preseason prediction as far as yeah. just the state of where this roster is right now. The roster is just not very good. They're not going to be a very good football team next year. So I think Terry Fontenot is just, they're just comfortable with pressing the reset button and just allowing Marcus Mariota to be that bridge for that guy in 2023 or potentially 2024. But don't you feel like the injury history of Mariota could be a red flag? Maybe not at eight, but I feel like the Falcons are a sneaky team that no one talks about. They also have two second round picks, two third round picks. They could also be a team that could trade back into the first, maybe for a quarterback. I guess the question really is the fact that Mariota is the only option and he has the injury history. Who else is going to be there with him? I guess is my question. Could they be a potential quarterback team in the back end of one or early in two, maybe? Well, possibly, but I think they're fine. If Mariota yeah. goes down just because they know that they're not going to be a contender anytime soon. So if Mariota goes down, that pick is probably going to be even higher. And I know they want to compete, but you have to be realistic with the state of your, with the state of your roster and where you are as a team right now. They understand that they're not a team that's going to compete in the NFC South. They're way behind the Saints, the Bucks, and they're even behind the Panthers too, in my opinion. So if Mariota does go down, that's good for them. Not wishing injury on him at all, but just right. saying if he does happen to go down, that just means that they're probably going to get a higher pick. So trying to figure out where the quarterback teams here are in the draft, if Panthers, let's say, go tackle, the Falcons go somewhere else, the next scenario for a quarterback comes where? Is that New Orleans or is that all the way down at 20 with Pittsburgh? Yeah, I think those two teams, I think they could be earmarked as possible quarterback landing spots, New Orleans. I don't necessarily, necessarily think they need a quarterback. And I think they kind of showed their hand a little bit, bringing back Jameis and then also signing Andy Dalton too. With the way Jameis played prior to the ACL tear, he was playing some of the best ball that he played in his career. Now the offense is going to be a little bit different now with Sean Payton not there. So we'll see what does happen with that. But I think they may be fine with Jameis and then also Andy Dalton. 
Now you can get an offensive tackle, and I expect them to address wide receiver very early too. So I don't necessarily think the Saints are going to address quarterback very early. I think they need an offensive tackle. They have to find a replacement for Taron Armstead. They don't have a left tackle right now, and they also need somebody to help out Michael Thomas too. And then when it comes to Pittsburgh, do you feel like they are a quarterback team? They signed Trubisky, more of a, again, similar deal where it's more money than Mariota, but it's incentive incentive laden. Um, when it comes to them, Kevin Colbert's final draft, do you feel like he's looking to get a quarterback to leave there with a quarterback of his choice? Yeah, so I have a Sharpie, a red marker, a red mark beside them as a team that possibly could trade up. I just have a feeling that Kevin Colbert might try to pull a Ozzy Newsome. You can remember Ozzy Newsome yes. traded back into the first round yes. to get Lamar Jackson, and everybody saw that as kind of a parting gift for the transition with him and Eric DaCosta. So I think Kerry, uh, excuse me, Kevin Colbert could look to do something similar. Now, it could be inside the top 10. It could be somewhere in the early teens to get like a Desmond Ritter or Malik Willis or even a Kenny Pickett. So I think they could be a potential trade-up team. Yeah, but I don't think the Steelers have really been hiding the fact that they've been in the quarterback market. They've traveled across the country to see all these quarterbacks. They've dined with them. I think uh, we were at the Senior Bowl. It was pouring rain, I think, on Wednesday, and just Mike Tomlin was on the field yeah. watching those quarterbacks very, very closely. All right, so we found out Pittsburgh is a team you feel like could be a quarterback team in this draft. Now, are there any other uh, teams maybe sliding back into the first round or in the back end of the first round where you could see them going quarterback or is that it for you? Um, I would say Seattle, especially with them having pick 40 and 41. I think they could be a team that slides back into the first round and whether it's Detroit at number 32 overall, that last pick in the first round, we could see a situation like a Lamar Jackson or a Teddy Bridgewater back in 2014. If you remember the Vikings trading up, I believe it was with Seattle getting back into um, yeah, get back into the back end of the first round. So I think that could be a situation that they look to explore. They could look to add best available player at number nine overall. And if a Desmond Ritter or a Sam Howell or a Matt Corral or somebody like that is sitting there at the back end of the first round, they could look to trade up to get that fifth year option. Interesting. I want to throw a scenario at you and I haven't really heard much about this, but could you see a team like Tennessee being a quarterback team at 24 with Ryan Tannehill, He'll be 35 very soon. The last memory of him is a not so great performance against the Bengals. Could the Titans be a potential quarterback team for you? They don't have a second round pick from the Julio trade as well. Is that crazy thinking by me or could that be a potential scenario? No, it's not crazy thinking at all. I think Tannehill just is what he is at this point. You know, he's going to perform really well in the regular season, but it's been the postseason of where he has struggled, especially without Derrick Henry when he's not option 1A on that offense. So I think they could look to get a young quarterback in there. They're sitting at number 26 overall. So right in the wheelhouse of where somebody could fall to them, or they could look to trade up to in front of the Steelers or in front of the saints or somebody like that to get in the mid to late teens type of type of area. So uh, no, I don't think you're crazy at all for thinking that. Yeah. I mean, I, I've just been getting, it's, it's very light buzz, but it feels like the tight ends and a quarterback is something that hasn't, hasn't been talked about enough. I know that, Luke Fickle and Mike Vrabel are actually close friends. Of course, Desmond Ritter is a quarterback in this draft who could be there at 26 for the Titans. And again, not having a second round pick makes it more complicated because I don't know really what you're going to get in the third round when it comes to quarterbacks. I don't think they have a viable backup right now on this roster as well. So it's definitely a team that I haven't heard much about, but it could be a sneaky quarterback team come Thursday night. Now, let me slide back up to number one and to the Jaguars. And you kind of mentioned it earlier. There's the Trayvon Walker talk. I feel like, I guess where I'm at right now is that I think they should take Aiden. They probably will take Trayvon Walker. And there are coaches who really love Icky and are pushing for that. Is that something that aligns with your thinking? Or what do you think the Jaguars end up doing at number one? Yeah, I think it's going to be Trayvon Walker, just based off what I've heard, the recent buzz as well. And Trent Baalke is in a similar situation of back when he selected Alden Smith. And if you remember, yeah. Alden Smith wasn't the most polished player of the bunch coming out that year, but he just liked the upside and the athleticism that was associated with him. So number one overall, very expensive as far as, far as draft capital, but just talking to defensive line coaches at the combine when I was there, they just kept gushing about Trayvon Walker, that he was misused. He wasn't allowed to really rush the passer, but six foot five, 270 pounds. He runs in the low four fives. And then he just flashed so much at Georgia and all those pieces that Georgia had, he flashed a whole bunch. And even though he only had nine and a half career sacks, 
they feel as if there's a lot more to his skill set that he wasn't able to show just because of the technique. He was playing that tight five technique, which is just on the outside shoulder of the offensive tackles. He wasn't really allowed to go and get or hunt the quarterback or pin his ears back. So I think there's just so much more potential that a lot of coaches like in Trayvon Walker, specifically Jacksonville, and they need some defensive pieces, especially along the defensive line on that team. Is the argument against Aiden Hutchins simply just the upside or what is it? Like, it was kind of funny, but I, I remember who said it, but somebody mentioned the fact that he went to Michigan and the Harbaugh and Balky relationship being so bad. That could be a reason just not to take him. What is the reason against the Hutchinson? Is it just the upside part of it? Yeah, I can't speak on the balky and the hardball thing. I don't know anything <laughs> about that, but <laughs> that would be extremely petty <laughs> if that was the reason behind it. But I mean, yeah, Aiden has one of the highest floors of this group. As far as you know, he's going to come in, he's going to work his tail off just because that's what he's always done. He's going to, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets 10 plus sacks as a rookie. Like I think he has that high of a floor, you know, exactly what you're going to get. But after that, you just don't know what else is left. But with Trayvon Walker, there's just so much more along with Kayvon Thibodeau and some of the other rushers in this class. And even though Hutchinson, the argument can be made that he's not as physically gifted as far as from a bend and cornering to the quarterback perspective as some of these other guys, they just feel as if there's more upside and just more left in the tank than Aiden Hutchinson does have right now. I have Aiden Hutchinson as my top ranked player overall. I just like the floor. And there's no such thing as a safe prospect when we're talking about the NFL draft. But yeah. you know exactly what you're getting with him as a rookie. I, mean, I think that would be a, a dream scenario for the Lions if it does happen yeah. and they end up getting Hutchinson, the hometown hero, to stay in the state of Michigan. Let me slide down to number four now because it feels like for a good chunk of the draft process, many people had the Jets going with Sauce at number four. And now it feels like more people are starting to lean towards Kevon Thibodeau there at number four. Where do you sit? for the Jets at number four and what they'll end up doing. And I guess how legitimate are those, you know, non-football questions for Thibodeau? I've had a lot of people say it's all fluff. It's all exaggerated. And some people actually believe it's a real thing. I mean, like, is that where people are at? How do you see that with Thibodeau? Well, from the media perspective, it's always hard to gauge those things just because we don't really get to sit down and interview these guys. The only time we really get to talk to them, is if you're writing something on them and you get to interview them. Otherwise, it's the podium sessions at the combine. Right. At the podium session, I thought Kayvon Thibodeau was terrific. He was very engaging, infectious personality. He was very magnetic. He gave very detailed and descriptive answers as well. And you can tell that he has some things that he wants to do outside of football. But sometimes there's some people that it kind of rubs a lot of people the wrong way if they're just not locked into just football when they're entering the NFL. But they have to understand with the new day and age of these prospects, they're going to have interest outside of the game too, as far as from a branding perspective, we're seeing that with NIL deals now and everything that's going on with college football. So yeah. it's not just solely about football and just gravitating everything towards football. And that's what you get from Kayvon Thibodeau. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the ever concerns. I don't see any of that on tape. I didn't see that. And I think an underrated thing that a lot of people are not talking about when they're thinking and evaluating Kayvon Thibodeau is that, when you think about all of the other top edge rushers in this draft class, where there's Aiden Hutchinson, okay, or excuse me, Aiden Hutchinson, um, Trayvon Walker, and then some of these other guys, they had that running mate on the other side of them that could take a little bit of pressure off of them. Aiden Hutchinson had David Ajabo, Trayvon Walker had a host of other people on that defensive line. At Oregon, it was just Kayvon Thibodeau. So all the pressure and the attention was just solely on him to where teams could double and triple team him as much as they wanted to just because they didn't have anybody else to worry about along that defensive line. Now, Oregon has some really good young linebackers that we'll be talking about a lot this time next year. But as far as the first level, it was just the Kayvon Thibodeau show. So I think that's a little tidbit that a lot of people aren't really worrying about or focusing on. It was just him along that defensive front. Interesting. I never really thought about that element, but it's, it's definitely true now that I give it some thought. And that that that's very interesting. And it feels like the thing about the non-football stuff, it's just that he expresses it openly while most yeah. players have that, it just they don't do it openly. He does. But really, a lot of people, at least to me, have said it's not much of a concern. And as you've mentioned, the tape doesn't really lie with him. Now, I guess Thibodeau, Stingley, and Kyle Hamilton are the three very intriguing prospects to me when it comes to the defensive side in this draft. What would be, I guess, the floor for those three guys come Thursday night? Um, I think for all of them, I don't think any of them make it past the Vikings at 12. I think I would be really surprised if any of any of those guys got us got outside of the top 12. I think Stingley would be a great fit in Minnesota. 
Obviously, they just hired LSU's defensive coordinator from a season ago, Durante Jones. Yeah. They have Patrick Peterson there as well to mentor him. We know the LSU connection with both of those guys are very strong. So Stingley doesn't get past 12. Thibodeau, I just don't see him getting past the Giants' second round pick, or excuse me, second first round pick at number seven overall. I would be really surprised if he got past that spot too. So with Kyle Hamilton, the commanders at 11 or the Vikings at 12, I think that's his floor as far as the latest he could go to. So number 12 overall, I think that should be earmarked as far as the latest any of those guys could go. When it comes to Hamilton, like when the draft process started and there was those early mocks, people had him going as high as three, to the Texans. What happened that he's been able to drop possibly out of the top 10? Is it just a 40 time that everyone had an uproar about? So this seems to happen with, the prospect every year and what happens is these guys are treated like gods prior to them being draft eligible but when they're put in the spotlight everybody starts to pick holes in them and i call this prospect fatigue these guys have been good for so long but when they're put under the light and they have to be draft eligible or they're forced to be draft eligible there's just so many holes the media teams pick into their games and we start talking about what they can't do as opposed to focusing on what they can do so that's what's happening with kyle hamilton you're going to see it next year with these quarterbacks, Bryce Young, CJ Stroud. They're treated like guys right now, but the Ohio state quarterback thing, and as well as the Alabama quarterback thing is something you're going to hear about. So obviously they're not draft eligible right now, but once again, just talking about and giving examples of prospect fatigue, it happened quite a bit with Trevor Lawrence last year too. And Justin Fields, if you remember, yes, both of, of those guys were, both of those guys were touted pretty much as gods, their freshman and sophomore seasons. But when they became draft eligible, they were put under the light. They went through the pre-draft process you started hearing the Ohio State quarterback thing with Justin Fields and then plenty of things with Trevor Lawrence, too. So I like to call it prospect fatigue. Yeah, but I think Fields is like the perfect example of what happened to Hamilton this year, where he started off, started off as number two to the Jets and then slid all the way down to 11, where a team had to trade up to get him. That's what it feels like is going on with Kyle Hamilton as well. Um, let me go now to number five with the Giants who pick at five and seven. There appears to be a strong belief they want to trade down with one of those picks. But when it comes to number five, there's a, there appears to be like a lot of buzz with Charles Cross, the Mississippi State offensive tackle. Um, how legitimate do you think that buzz is? And could he play right tackle, which I think is the bigger question with him? Because the Giants probably have Andrew Thomas at left. They're looking for someone to take over the right side. Could he do that? Yeah, I think so. And the first thing that I'll say this about Charles Cross, big, big fan, been a fan of Cross since last summer. He's one that I made everybody aware of as far as he could have a big year coming into this year, just because he was so good as a redshirt freshman. And then we saw what he was able to do as a redshirt sophomore. And the thing with Cross is that he's an example of what I like to call an ascending prospect. Every year of football that he played, he's gotten better every single year. Prior to his junior season in high school, he was only a three-star recruit. A lot of people didn't know a whole bunch about him. By the time he's a senior, he's the best prospect in the state of Mississippi, and he goes to Mississippi State. Obviously, we saw what he, what he was able to do after he did his redshirt season, his redshirt freshman season, and then he followed that up with a terrific redshirt sophomore season. Now, on the, cave, or the caveat of that, on the flip side, Charles Cross – Everybody's not He's not going to be the flavor of every team. I will say that just because last season, Mississippi State had 81 to 19% splits yes. as far as a pass to run ratio. So in that Mike Leach offense, that's why he's the most polished pass protector of this bunch, but he's just inexperienced as a run blocker. It's not that he can't do it. It's just, that, it's just that he doesn't have a lot of reps doing so. So I think he's going to be one of the best players overall in this draft class. I have him as my number ninth ranked overall player in this class. The big question with him, can he play right tackle? He's never played it before, but we're talking about one of the more athletic players, not only at offensive tackle, but of this draft class as a whole. It's different mechanisms, different developments as far as different muscle memory going from the left side to the right side. So there's going to have to be a lot of trust as far as him learning footwork, new footwork, having his left foot up as opposed to left foot back and that left tackle stance. But if I'm the Giants, you compare Andrew Thomas with Charles Cross, I would be all for that. Now, the thing with Cross with the Giants at five, which is interesting, is that people have him going there despite either an Icky or Evan Neal still being on the board. Is that a realistic option come Thursday night? Yeah, I think so. And you could ask 10 area scouts. They would have 10 different orders as far as how they like these three guys. I don't think you can go wrong with any of them, honestly. And it's kind of like that offensive tackle group that we saw a few years ago where it was Andrew Thomas, Jedrick Wills, 
uh, Tristan Wurst, that type of group. Now, I don't, in Becton as well, I yeah. don't think these guys are as good as those guys, but just talking about, I don't think it can go wrong with any of them. But I really like this offensive tackle class, specifically those three. Yep, and it feels like Cross, especially someone who keeps on being pushed up the board, I don't think he gets out of the top 10. I think five and six with the Giants and Panthers are definitely realistic options, if not there. Um, Number nine with Seattle could be an option as well for him. Let's talk about some receivers here. Um, Let me start off simple. How many wide receivers do you believe are the first round caliber guys? Because I've continuously heard just five, and that's Williams, Wilson, Olave, London, and Burks. And then I guess secondly, I look at Green Bay and Kansas City, 22 and 28, and then Kansas City, 29 and 30. Are those guys even going to be there once they're they're turn to pick? Uh, it just depends. It's going to be really tough with this wide receiver class. I don't know where the first one is going to go. I think the wide receiver run could start with the Falcons at number eight overall. I think you could see a Drake London go there. You could see Jamison Williams or you could see Garrett Wilson. I think those are probably your three guys where it could go where they could go with that number eight overall pick. The Jets at ten obviously are going to be in the wide receiver market based on the Debo Samuel stuff that we've heard them being in contention for Tyreek Hill as well. It's obvious, it's obvious that Joe Douglas wants to get a bona fide number one wide receiver in there for Zach Wilson. So I don't think they're going to take one at four. I just think that's just a little bit too rich for anybody in this class, but 10, I think they could be in position to take the first wide receiver off of the board 11 with the commanders 12 to the Vikings. There's just so many different spots that you could pick and choose of where these guys could go. But I think we could see six in the first round. I've already talked about two already, Garrett Wilson, Drake London, uh, Jamison Williams, Chris Olave, Traylon Burks, but John Dotson is one that definitely could go in the first round as well. Don't count his name out either. I think the chiefs at 29 or 30, he could go there. He could go as high as 22 or 28 to the Packers too. So there's so many different spots of where these guys could go, but I think at most we will see in the first round is six. Interesting. I think the chiefs having, I think it's 12 picks, the most in the entire NFL is noteworthy because I don't really know if they could even use 12 rookies on this team. So a trade up to get one of those, those receivers could be a possibility. And the other element, which I mean, it's talked about, but I think it should be talked about more is just the veteran wide receiver market. And that is of course, Debo, AJ and DK, Obviously, they all want new deals. The wide receiver market has just gotten to a point where no one could have expected it to. And I really don't know if all three of those guys are going to be with their current teams once the season starts. And I think the bigger point, which is starting to get some traction but hasn't gotten much traction, is the fact all three of these guys have the same agent, which is just massive in all this because I can't say it enough, but he really controls everything with those guys. The fact they're all with the same agent. Okay, a couple more before I wrap this up. Every year, there are guys who slide into the back of the first round, surprisingly. Last year, I think it was like Peyton Turner to the Saints. Who could be that guy this year in the back end of the round one? It's Quay Walker, the linebacker from Georgia, playing alongside Nicobe Dean, 6'4", 240. He has the size, the speed, the weight, and the height that you love to see at the position. He's very physical. was only a one-year starter at Georgia. And like Trayvon Walker, upside and potential are two words that are really associated with his scouting report and his portfolio a lot. So there's a lot of people that really like him in the back end of the first round. I think the Lions at 32 could take him. And there's plenty of other linebacker needed teams that could trade back into that bottom half of the first round to take Quay Walker. So he would be the one. All right. Last one here. I hate to put you on the stop. I hate to put you on the spot, but the biggest surprise we see on Thursday night is what? Take a swing, Jordan. Give me something juicy. Ooh, man, you put me on the spot here. Um, Not saying this is going to happen, but just being pretty bold, I'm going to say Desmond Ritter is the first quarterback that is selected off of the board. Now, I don't have a team or I don't have a range, but I'm going to just say Desmond Ritter, quarterback Cincinnati, is the first one off of the board. It's it's interesting because, like, it is very bold, but the one thing you keep on hearing, I'm sure you've heard it as well, is that he's just blown teams away during his entire pre-draft process. I don't know where he ends up going. I do think he goes in the first round, wherever it is. It's going to be fascinating, especially if six and eight and nine, all those teams pass on quarterbacks. We have a slide. I don't know what happens from there. Um, It is bold, Jordan, but um, I don't think it's the craziest thing. That's all I'm going to say, because it's true. (laughs) Ritter has not gotten much buzz, at least nationally, but it just feels like everyone you talk to says this guy is really impressive. He's a winner. He gets the job done. 
we'll see what happens. Um, it's going to be fascinating. If there's one thing that I keep on telling myself throughout every year when draft night comes, it's expect the unexpected. I think we'll have a lot of that on Thursday night once the draft gets underway. Jordan, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, congrats on all your success. Everyone can go and follow you on Twitter. It is at Jordan underscore read. You are a tremendous follow. Enjoy the draft and hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. Absolutely. Thanks as always. And congrats on your success too. And just thank you as always for having me on. It's always a pleasure.